to Do Not Destroy. I, I don't know how that tune goes. If any of y'all know how Do Not Destroy goes. We know what the words are because it's in the psalm, right? <laughs> Not sure how the tune goes, though. But It's called A, a Mitchem of David when Saul sent men and they watched the house in order to kill him. So not, you know, not a really friendly setting, right? So it's, he's, he's you know, running for his life. It doesn't look good. But you know, I found out amazing. He goes here at, at the end of the psalm. We'll pick it up at the end. He goes, uh, verse 14. And at the evening, he's talking about these guys chasing him, right? At the evening, they return. They growl like a dog. And they go all around the city. They wander up and down for, for food. And they howl if they're not satisfied. And then he says this, which I think is amazing. He says, but, verse 16, but I will sing of your power. Yes, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning. For you have been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. To you, O my strength, I will sing praises. For God is my defense, my God of mercy. He said, wow. So all these other, all these other folks are growling, right? And he's, and he's singing praises. But I will sing. Isn't that a great determination? You make that determination. Okay, all this stuff is going, you know, going sideways around me, but I will sing. Isn't that great? Let's pray, and then we're going to get started. We'll sing. Hallelujah. Amen. Lord, thank you for your goodness tonight, and uh, thank you for your mercy that, Lord, we can even be here, sit under the ministry of your word, and Lord, you can change us by the power of your word tonight, and we thank you for that. Thank you for the opportunity here to gather as uh, believers to uh, come into your presence to, and to sing uh, these songs unto you to lift you up, to see our Savior exalted here. Thank you that you're a God of wonders, and you're good, and you're gracious in, in so many ways. Lord, we thank you, praise you, and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you stand? We'll, we'll sing that. God's wonders. Lord of all creation, of a water of earth and sky, the heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy, Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of heaven and earth. So early in the morning. I will celebrate life when I stumble in the darkness. I will call your name back night. God of wonders beyond the galaxy, you are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy, Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of heaven and earth, hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth, hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth, hallelujah the Lord of heaven and earth. Amen. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty, you are holy. Father, holy, holy, the universe declares your majesty, 
The Lord of heaven and earth. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. Amen. Splendor of the King. Clothed Oh, 
sweet to walk in this pilgrimage on the everlasting love. Oh, ever right the path goes day to day, on the everlasting love. Dread or what have I to feel on the everlasting eye of blessed peace with my Lord so near on the everlasting Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening, Lord. We're so thankful we come together again, Lord, and worship you, Lord, and, and hear your word. Uh, Lord, we just pray for this evening. Thank you for bringing us together, Lord, in your name. Amen. amen. Good evening. Amen. Please take a minute to say hello to your neighbor. Good evening. Welcome to this Wednesday service. If you're online, we're glad to have you as well. Moving along in May, it felt like summer today, didn't it? Uh, hottest day yet that, that I went for a run, so I've got to get used to that again. Uh, but uh, good to see you all tonight, and a couple of things before we get into uh, Joshua chapter 5. Uh, it's been a couple weeks, so it's good to get back into this. But I just wanted to let you know, Sunday, I think I, I didn't even mention it in the second service, but I did mention it in the 830 service. I was praying whether I was going to be doing the next section in Acts or a Mother's Day topical message. And after praying about it, this is what the Lord led me to do. So I haven't done a Mother's Day message, I think, in about four years. So, uh, so invite all the moms you know. And um, even though it's a Mother's Day message, it's no more only for moms than tonight's. Joshua 5, which is about circumcision, and Joshua is only for men. So uh, the Bible w kind of works that way, uh, whether it would be about Mary or uh, whether it would be about Paul, it, it really is applicable to everybody. Uh, you know, moms will be on the bullseye it, to some extent, but there'll be a lot in there for every servant of Jesus. So come out Monday or, or Sunday. You can come Monday too if you want, but... Um, uh, but Sunday for sure, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, celebrating the moms, but the um, Lord gave me that passage, uh, the mother of Moses, and we'll be looking at that, the ministry uh, of motherhood, and uh, so we'll see what God does with that, and we'll get back into Acts the week after that, but uh, at least this coming Sunday. That means that I will also for this year do a Father's Day message, and I think I, think I know why the Lord uh, put it on my heart this year. I don't know if you know this, but God-designed roles are under attack in our country. That's why I believe God had me. It was like clear as a bell. I prayed about it. I prayed about it for several days because I really wasn't sure. I'm like, Lord, uh, we're right in the middle of this chapter in Acts. Do you want me to take a time out? And I felt like the Lord was like, he gave me certain passages, and I really believe it's because God-defined roles are under attack in the United States and, and around the world for that matter, but, uh, but definitely here. And so uh, for that reason and other reasons, uh, uh, we also want to see the moms encouraged. And we also have a lot of new young moms, a lot of moms with babies. Then, then we've, got, uh, we've got a lot of moms that uh, are widows. And so God's going to speak to all points in between, uh, but also uh, all the men too. So uh, with that, I think that's all I have. So turn with me to uh, Joshua chapter 5. 
And we will, we've been, uh, we've doing, been doing a good job of covering entire chapters on these Wednesday nights, and we're going to do the same again tonight. 15 verses is not near as daunting as next week, 27 verses, but, uh, uh, but 15 tonight, and uh, we will get through that, and next week we'll be looking at the walls of Jericho coming down. So that's kind of the progress uh, that we'll be making, starting in verse 1, and I'm just going to read uh, verses 1 through uh, 3. One through three. These are long verses, actually. Uh, Starting verse one, so it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan before the children of Israel uh, until we had crossed over that their heart melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives for yourself, and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. So Joshua made flint knives for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel at the hill of foreskins. Let's pray again. Father, we bow before you tonight. We thank you for this midweek uh, gathering. Uh, The worship was so sweet. Thank you for this time that we could just lift up our voices to you, this midweek respite, uh, to sing as a body. We can sing alone or by ourselves, but Lord, there's something special about coming together, to sing together, to worship you together, to open the word together. Uh, Lord, we thank you that your spirit is in our presence. We thank you, Lord, that we're looking at something that was under the old covenant, but Lord, uh, we now see uh, additional revelation here in the new covenant uh, under the blood of Jesus. So Lord, we pray that your spirit Uh, which is in this place tonight, would move mightily. We pray that you'd speak to each and every heart what they need to hear, those online. Remove every distraction, Lord, and may you fill us, uh, Lord, with the truth and the direction and the counsel that you desire for us to have. But, Lord, we would also not just be receiving it, but applying it and walking in it. Uh, Lord, I pray for your anointing and your help and your strength. And, uh, Lord, we just thank you for this time. May you be honored and glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Quick question. You know, uh, we just had a hymn. Uh, Jason thought he needed a hymn book. And uh, you know that you'll trust and obey for there's no other way? Which ones do you think is easier, trust or obey? Yeah, probably. Although, if we, if we don't obey, the question is how much do we trust in the first place? Uh, because the more we trust, the more it is, you know, I would say the more you trust God, the more likely it is that obedience is going to be something you're not resisting because you really do trust that obeying him is in your best interest. And, of course, we know it glorifies and honors God. But, you know, that uh, both of them go together. We're going to see both in this text tonight. But the children of Israel, they had waited for generations to come into the promised land. And they were finally in the land, uh, going back to chapter 4, And yet they had to wait a little longer to possess the land. They were in the land, but they're going to have to wait a little bit longer to possess this land. Back in chapter 3, if you go back to chapter 3, you don't have to turn there, but if you go back to chapter 3, you'll recall they had sanctified themselves. They had obeyed, which is important. They had obeyed the commands of Joshua to gather their possessions, and they were to follow the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, it was carried by the Levites on poles from Acacia Grove, which is seven miles uh, east of the Jordan, uh, to the banks of the Jordan. They had followed by faith as the Lord had halted the waters, which no one in the history of the world has ever seen except for here. They had, uh, the Lord had halted the waters of the Jordan River. Uh, when the priest, when their ankles or their feet got into just the uh, overflowing banks there, the Lord began to halt the waters, and they saw, Israel saw, the river's waters stand up like a heap, the text said. It was a wall of water that just kind of stopped and just continued to collect like a reservoir, like a dam, like the Hoover Dam, just kind of pushing the water back, becoming Lake Mead if you're out in Nevada. But here it was just kind of holding right in place, and they passed over by faith, and, and to their utter amazement, As they moved from east to west, to the west side of the Jordan, and they moved on dry land, not even any dampness. 
No mud. The, the carts, the oxen could roll over on dry land. They saw a miracle that was on par with what God had shown with the Red Sea crossing, where Moses had seen the Red Sea parted right down the middle. They saw Joshua, after they got to the other side, they saw Joshua build a memorial of 12 stones, and he placed them, if you recall, in the center of the dry Jordan Riverbed. You say, why would you do that, Joshua? Why would you put them in the center of the riverbed? And they would remain there when the waters returned, so the waters would then cover those stones. They saw the waters return and their overflow banks. And by the way, we recall that that memorial, the stones being covered, pictured the, resurrect, or the, the, the death and burial of Jesus, and then the stones on the other side would picture the resurrection. But they saw the waters return, and they didn't just return, they overflowed the banks. But they didn't overflow the banks, and they didn't return until every single person had crossed, and that riverbed memorial had been built. And then according to the commandment of God, the children of Israel built a second 12 stone memorials. So two, one in the riverbed, they built a second one on the eastern border of Jericho as a remembrance to future generations that God had turned back the waters and miraculously brought all 12 tribes. And again, those stones represented the resurrection of Jesus. So the burial of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and they're just, it's like a straight line between the two. So maybe, just maybe, the children of Israel are thinking, now maybe everything is ready to go to take Jericho, be the first city in the conquest of the promised land. But I don't know if you've ever noticed this in your life. Even when things look and appear ready, God makes the final decision. You ever been ready for something and all of a sudden the door closed? I remember uh, we were living in Charlotte. I had no idea it was good. Well, I did have an idea. I did have an idea God was going to call me into ministry, but I was in a, my prior career, and I mean, we were thought for sure I was going to take a job transfer to Dallas, Texas, and it was like we were looking at houses, and, uh, and then that door just got slammed shut, and God brought me to Richmond, Virginia, and now I know why. But everything appeared ready, but God's the one that makes the final decision. <laughs> Nothing is ready until God says it is ready. The children of Israel, they were on the doorstep of a conquest promised by God. God had promised them they were going to receive the promised land. They are on the doorstep of this, but there was still some needed preparation. Success was not going to depend on their abilities. It never depends on our abilities. That's kind of good to know. We're just saying leaning on the everlasting arms of Jesus. It depends on His infinite ability. It was going to depend, though, their success in taking the promised land was going to depend on their surrender and consecration. Their surrender and their consecration. The same is true for us. And although they had fully sanctified themselves on that east side of the Jordan, going back to chapter 3, the Lord identifies one last, really really, really important step in their readiness. And all the men didn't see this coming. <laughs> and it's going to be a difficult delay. Difficult might be an understatement uh, to ensure that the path forward is blessed by God. And if you're taking notes, you see the title this evening, Made Ready to Advance, Obedience Prepares the Way. Uh, back to verse 1. Uh, before we get into what God's going to call them to. And uh, so it was, when all the kings of the Amorites were on the west side of the Jordan, all the kings of the Canaanites were on the, over by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over, that their heart melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. Word had spread like wildfire, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have satellite TV, they didn't have streaming, but they had couriers and they had word of mouth and they had trade routes and the word had spread that God had held back the waters. And I'm, I'm sure it wasn't just coming from Israel, I'm sure people in the Canaanites had seen this miracle too and had witnessed it themselves. They didn't, they didn't have cameras to take pictures, all they could do was tell people. 
that God had held the waters back and that the people and the tribes and, you know, at least a couple million, uh, all the armies of Israel had crossed the formerly overflowing banks of the Jordan on dry ground. And all the kings of Canaan, which would be up to the border of modern-day Lebanon, all the way down south, going towards Egypt, not quite that far. But all the kings of Canaan from the Jordan to the Mediterranean Sea. And by the way, both those bodies of water in the news right now. Did you guys know that? We've got college kids who don't know which river or which sea it is. But it is in the news. They do know there's a river and they do know there's a sea. They just don't know what they're called. Maybe they think it's the Gulf of Mexico and the, and the Mississippi. I'm not sure. But, but these two bodies of water are in the news today. And here they were then from, from the Jordan to the Mediterranean Sea. Because everything in prophecy is going to end up in this place. The kings of the Amorites and the kings of the Canaanites, they had the same response. Both groups of kings, their hearts melted with fear. They felt a despair. They felt a foreboding that literally drained their energy. You ever have a strike of fear that kind of saps you for a little bit? Maybe momentarily, maybe longer. But here's what was taking place. Judgment was coming. In some respects, at least they were smart enough to be fearful and, and their hearts melting. I, I, I wish America would fear judgment coming. But we're not even smart enough to sense that. They were. They they were petrified to some degree. Their hearts were melting. Even Rahab said the same thing. Remember, she had the same testimony, that, that people were scared. And this judgment from God that was now at their doorstep was a long time coming. God really delays judgment a long time. Generally speaking for the nations, if you study the scriptures, usually nations get a, quite a chunk of time. This was a long time coming. The nations of Canaan, they had been in sin. I mean, really grievous sin. Child sacrifice, all types of sexual sin, idolatry of every kind, perversion for centuries. Now, we know today that even some of the things God's going to call uh, Israel to do uh, with diseases and things, you can see why God was going to say wipe out some of these civilizations. It may not be pleasant, but God says sin isn't pleasant either to him. 400 plus years earlier from this time, so go back 400 plus, about 430 years earlier, 400 plus years earlier, the nations of Canaan, they had witnessed, now obviously this is Many generations back, if you take, take a generation being 100 years, that'd be four generations. But if you say, well, no, I want to say generations are 50, 70, 80, there's different ways of looking at it. But multiple generations back, if you go back 400 plus years, the nations of Canaan, the people of Canaan, their, their forefathers had literally seen with their own eyes the faithful lives of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You all know that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had already lived in this place 400 and some years earlier. God even told Abraham, he told Abraham the length of time that the Amorites mentioned here in verse 1, you see the Amorites are mentioned in verse 1, he had told Abraham that the length of time that the Amorites would be given to turn from their sins, as well as Israel would be given the same amount of time to be tested by God. It's found in Genesis 15, 16. It's up on the screen. But in the fourth generation, so here God defines a generation as 100 years, which is kind of interesting if you're thinking about Israel becoming a nation in 1848. 100 years later, it would be 2048. We're getting close, folks. <laughs> I don't know what that exactly means. I just know that... Uh, if you look at a generation here, it was Jesus' reference as well. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here. Abraham says, your people are going to leave here, but come back here. It would be weird if America was founded, and then we leave for 400 years and came back. 
We've been here all that time. I mean, if you, I know that we didn't become a nation officially till post Declaration of Independence, and even it wasn't even on that day that was a declaration. But you know, we've kind of been operating as a people group even in that range. If you go back to the Puritans or Jamestown, in that same amount, uh, same similar time frame. But he says, in the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity. And here it is, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Now, Abraham had already witnessed a lot of sin among the people of Canaan. Abraham had even been used by God to rescue. If you'll recall, Abraham was used by God. It was a miraculous military feat. He was used by God to rescue the king of Sodom, who did not deserve rescuing. But neither do you and I, right? He had been used to rescue the king of Sodom, and then later God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, rained fire and brimstone on those cities right there in Canaan. Why? Because they never repented. Nor had the nations all around them. In 400 plus years, no one had repented, at least not as a group. Maybe individual people, but the nations themselves. After the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah, there's no indication that anybody else said, hey, we don't want that to happen to us. We should repent. Nope, everyone kept on doing so. Well, that, that's poor shame that, that, that weird hailstorm just fell right on them. And even the next four centuries, there was no repentance in the nations of Canaan. Israel was tested during that time. They were in bondage in the same 400 years. Israel was under their testing, and the nations were under their long leash of God's timeline of saying, repent, 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 repent. But God was still not ready. Even at this point, God was still not ready, even though it looks like they're at the doorstep, and they are. God was still not ready to send Joshua and Israel into battle. He had one final important area of preparation that he required before blessing the conquest and victory that he promised to Joshua and to the 12 tribes. Pick it up in verse 2 and 3. We read it already at that time, so that at that time the kings are shaking in their boots. They're wondering, when is Israel going to make their assault? Uh, are we going to survive? Is this God that you know, part of the Jordan going to give them extra military prowess? Uh, at that time, while Israel is there on the other side, the Lord says to Joshua, make flint knives for yourself. Not the best cutting instrument I've ever seen. but uh, And circumcised the sons of Israel the second time. Joshua made the flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel. All the men that had been part of the original exodus, the exodus from Egypt, going back 40 years, so that would be 40 years earlier. All the men that had come out of Egypt in the exodus, they had already been circumcised prior to the deliverance out of Egypt. But when it came time to take the promised land, now they're in Canaan. Well, when they, I'm sorry, go back to the desert. They're in the desert. They had been told by God to move forward. Remember, Moses sends the 12 spies. Ten say, impossible task. We'll be smoked. None of us will survive. Only Joshua and Caleb said, the Lord can do this. We'll do this. So, when they were given the opportunity to go into the promised land the first time, that's why it says the second time here, the first time the men, the warriors, the people as a whole balked. And they sided with the ten spies who in fear said, there's no way we can take the giants to the land. I mean, yes, God, here's the thing. God can part the Red Sea, but he can't take on giants. Yes, he can take on Pharaoh, but he can't take on giants. So all that generation, because they neither trusted nor obeyed, they died in the wilderness. They all died in the wilderness. Um, now, verses 2 and 3 here. It, so this second time, uh, the second circumcision here, it's not a second time for each individual male because the males that were circumcised earlier had already died. But it's the second time for the nation, a, a, a nationwide circumcision. 
as circumcision had been neglected for the 40 years in the wilderness. It had been neglected even though it was something that God had required. Uh, this may not even have been on Joshua's mind for whatever reason. Joshua's got, you know, if, if you're a leader, you've got a long list of things you're focused on. And circumcision was, in, as best we could tell, was not on his mind. Nor was it on the people's mind, but it was on God's mind. That they had forgotten the covenant that he had made with Abraham and his descendants through Isaac. And it's found in Genesis 17, verse 10 through 12. It's up on the screen. And this is what God said. This is God speaking directly to Abraham. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and your descendants after you. Well, the descendants don't want to do it. They have to. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. No one gets say. I'm not getting circumcised card. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. It shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. This even happened with Jesus on the eighth day. Every male in, every male child in your generations. Now as soon as Joshua hears the Lord say, everyone needs to be circumcised, so Joshua says, oh yeah, how did we miss this? He immediately they make these flint knives. Joshua doesn't delay. He doesn't counter to God with a command or a requested alternative. Say, hey, instead of that, why don't we do this? Sometimes you and I do that, right? God, what about this instead? He doesn't complain about it. Of course, Joshua's already circumcised. <laughs> Good thing you guys get to do this. He doesn't ask why. Why? Because he already knows what the scriptures say. He presumably, with help, I'm sure he doesn't do all of this on his own. There's many that would have been helping, but they make the flint knives. They circumcise all the sons of Israel. What a, no wonder it says hill here. <laughs> I'm just saying what the text says, folks. I, 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 I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, there's a lot of things in the Bible that I might not have written, uh, but God doesn't ask us. And then we're told why this was done. We're told why it's done in verses 4 through 7. And this is the reason, I already mentioned it, uh, that Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war had died in the wilderness on the way, for they'd come out of Egypt. For all the people who came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness on the way that came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. So that's the current group, not circumcised. All the ones that died prior had been circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness to all the people who were men of war who came out of Israel were consumed, consumed because they would not go forward into the promised land uh, on the initial um, command because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. They disobeyed. And them, them and the ten spies all fell, to whom the Lord swore that he would show to them uh, the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he would give us a land flowing with milk and honey. Then Joshua circumcised their sons whom he had raised in their place, for they were uncircumcised because they had, had not been circumcised in the way. And so, as I mentioned, uh, that generation prior had already died, so now this group, God says, we can't go forward until this group, this second generation, is all circumcised as their fathers were. Now they're still going to have to test, be tested even after circumcision. First of all, they're going to have to test, will they obey and get circumcised on this particular day? Everyone on the same day. Uh, and will they go forward after this? But God's like, we're not moving forward. We're not going forward to Jericho until this is done. The generation died in the wilderness. They never saw the promised land. You can't see the promised land disobeying God. You can't see God's promises in your life disobeying Jesus. Amen? Uh, the promises that he promises us, uh, that, that we'd be filled with the Holy Spirit, these are dependent upon obeying him. I was listening to, uh, or you know, I was, I, yeah, I read this recently. I was reading a quote from Elizabeth Elliot. I didn't put it up on the screen, but I was reading something she said, and she was talking about that every, if you ever feel distant from the Lord, if you ever feel discombobulated, if you ever feel 
uh, any type of friction uh, in your life. She said, you know, the only way out of it is obedience to Christ. That obedience to God, it, it, if you feel far from the Lord, you can only draw near, you can only abide in him through obedience. That the Lord's usually identifying some area where, in, where we're in disobedience, where we're rebelling against the Spirit speaking to us, doing it our own way. And so she said, in that case, you will never feel, you'll never feel intimacy with Christ in a state of disobedience. And, and you'll have all other kinds of things that are at war in ourselves until we obey. And so they, the prior generation, had not seen the promised land. They missed out on the land flowing with milk and honey simply because they had already seen God do all the miracles in Egypt. They'd already seen the Red Sea. They'd already seen God split the rocks and water, all these kind of things. And yet they still said, this, this next job is too big for God or too big for us. And they neither, neither trusted nor obeyed. But circumcision itself, it's a picture, it's a type. Uh, obviously, it's a real thing. It was real then, it's still real now. Um, and we even know today medically that the eighth day is the best day for, uh, you know, kind of the blood clotting and all these different things. But, uh, but circumcision was a picture, was a type, it was a shadow of the uh, necessary work that Christ would do in us. But also, uh, the land flowing milk and, with milk and honey, that also was a type and a foreshadow of, we talked about this before, that the land flowing milk and honey was a type and a foreshadow of the Spirit-filled life that would come with being a disciple of Jesus and then being filled with His Spirit. Listen, far too many Christians die in the wilderness of life. Far too many Christians die in the wilderness of life, never living the victorious life in the Spirit that God has called them to. That's why we pray for revival, because if a revival is poured out, many believers would live life in the Spirit, not just a tiny few, but the whole body of Christ. But during that 40-year desert period, which began by resisting God's prompting to go into Canaan, that same generation, they, they failed to circumcise their sons. So they not only, um, you know, when they had resisted God, they kind of like laid aside just about everything. Didn't circumcise their kids. They did not model obedience to God. And as circumcision, it was to be an act of consecration. Obviously, parents were consecrating the kids because you know, the kids don't have any choice in that matter. This generation would because they, these are adults that are actually receiving that circumcision uh, that, that uh, Joshua comes and says, I've got an announcement to make. <laughs> Can you imagine that day? They were like, what, what, what is it going to be? You're not going to believe the request God gave me. Well, we can't wait to hear it. Oh, yeah, yeah you, you'll want to not hear it, but you're going to hear it. You know, so. But circumcision was an act of consecration. And that generation prior, they were not consecrated to the Lord, and thus they had not consecrated their children to the Lord. And we see this a lot today, um, that parents that aren't uh, really committed to Christ they wonder why their kids aren't committed to Christ. Now, but God gives each and every person, we see this in the book of Ezekiel, God gives each and every person, each and every generation, a personal choice. Kids can choose opposite of their parents. Parents can choose opposite of their children. That's why we pray for prodigals that are in this church. We have a lot of you that, that have raised your kids and your kid will say, hey, I, don't, I don't want this. I don't want to be circumcised by God in the heart. Joshua is going to later say, choose you this day. Right? right? He's going to make it clear that everyone has that choice. He's the one that's going to have that verse that is all over Pinterest and other places. Choose you this day. He's the guy that's going to say that. 
who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So each generation has that choice. Each nation has that choice. Each individual has that choice. America right now, we're not just voting in an election in the fall. We're voting on God. And right now, it's not looking like a good vote. We're voting against the Lord in our lives, in our actions. That's why we're called to intercede like, like Abraham interceded for Sodom. That's, that's all we can do, which is a lot, actually, but it's what we're called to do. Verse 8, so it was when they had finished the circumcision. All the men were like, yes, this day is uh, almost over. Oh, they had circumcised all the people. They stayed in their places in the camp till they were healed. Here in this new generation, like Joshua and Caleb had done many years earlier, the whole of the people. Remember, way back then, it was Joshua and Caleb, it was Moses, it was Eleazar. It was just a handful of people that really yielded to the Lord, a little remnant. But here, many years later, they yield collectively, all the men, all the warriors. They yield to the command of the Lord. They obey the Lord. They have a different choice to make than their parents made. They surrender to this call to be circumcised. But more importantly, they're surrendering to a call to consecrate their lives to the God who had saved them out of the wilderness. Because you, you don't survive in the desert for 40 years unless God's there. There's nothing to eat there. They were eating manna, which we're going to see in just a few minutes. They, there's nothing to eat in the desert. There's nothing to drink in the desert. There's nothing but rattlesnakes and scorpions and all that kind of stuff. It's not a fun place. Looks pretty in pictures. It's not near as enjoyable to hang out there. But the God who had saved them and brought them into the promised land, they're consecrating their lives. Say, if God has preserved us, we are reserving our lives for Him. We're giving our lives back. Let me say also that circumcision was also, it illustrated the putting off of the filth of the flesh for the purity of God's plan. Putting off the filth of the flesh for the purity of God's plan. Which, to put off the filth of our flesh, think about this in the New Testament under the New Covenant that we now have in the Holy Spirit, in the blood of Jesus, we know that the putting off of the flesh or the denying, the resisting of the flesh is essential for victory in the Christian life. And it was essential then. Any would-be servant of God has to die to the flesh. You cannot do whatever you feel like doing. Even if God says, it's going to be a tough day, but you're all going to benefit years from now because of this day. That's why, if we pray for revival, if there was a tough day, you know, when some of the evangelists like D.L. Moody and others preached, and, and altar calls would be full of people weeping, it was a tough day, but it was a good day, wasn't it? Because people were shedding off, they weren't being circumcised, but they were shedding off, they were, getting, they were laying their flesh at the cross. Same picture. And this was a painful day. As it does cost us something to lay aside our will for God's will. Would you guys agree with that? Yes. It costs us something to lay aside. I, I look back, there's many things I can look back, me and my, my wife both can say, that cost us something, but it was, it was the right decision. That cost us something, but it's the right decision. It's always worth it to choose God's will over our will. Amen. There's not a man in that group that's going to regret this day 10 years later. Not even 10 days later. Well, maybe 10 days. 10 how long the healing process was. But, but not 10 months later. Not 10 weeks later. And they're wise, too, because women want to follow men that are following the Lord. Amen? Ladies like, yeah. I wish my husband was here tonight. You know what I mean? This, by the way, was also a big act of faith. 
There's also a big act of faith. The fighting force of Israel, think about the warriors here. The fighting force of Israel would be very vulnerable to an attacking army while all the men, all the men except for maybe Joshua and Caleb and a handful, and the two of them are pretty good warriors, but virtually all the men, 99% of the men, are completely incapacitated. If any of the kings of the Amorites say, hey, let's just, let's just go on the offense first, let's punch first, not wait to be punched. Remember back in Genesis chapter 34, those of you who have read the whole book of Genesis, uh, Simeon and Levi, they're just two guys. They were two wild dudes at the time, but they were two men. And they, they made everyone in Shechem get circumcised. They slaughtered the entire city of men by just the two of them because everyone there was healing. It's a very vulnerable... And I'm sure the children of Israel knew that story. Uh, Joshua, question. <laughs> what if the Amorites attack any time in the next several days? We're going to have to wait and see what God does. This, does. this seems like a horrible decision from a military standpoint. So this was an act in trusting in God's protection. You see the layers that was going on here? God was saying, you've got to obey. You're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to do something that your flesh doesn't want to do. We don't like pain. We don't like trials. We don't like all that stuff. And we see that all the people were consecrated that day. Look what it says in verse 8 again. They finished circumcising all the people. Now, obviously, all the people's, the men specifically, but interesting here. Back in verses 2 through 7, and you can underline them if you want, it's six mentions here. It mentions sons. It mentions sons of Israel. It mentions males. It mentions men of war. But here it says all the people. Because all the people were obeying by faith. The, the women were consecrating themselves in their hearts. The men were consecrating in their hearts and in their flesh. And lastly, they stay in the camp till everyone is healed. I'm looking forward to more of everyone in CCR healed. How about you? When we consecrate our lives, he's going to heal us of a lot of things, brother and sister. He'll heal a lot of people in the camp if we will yield to the voice of the Lord. There, there's a lot of, un, would you guys agree there's a lot of unnecessary pain? Unnecessary divorces, unnecessary just addictions, unne because people will not yield to the voice of the Lord. And that kind of pain can be healed, but not until we say, Lord, I'm laying my flesh at your feet. And then he'll heal a lot of wounds. There are people that are just still bitter. I'm, I'm never forgiving this person, ever. I remember Sam was telling me about a lady he visited in the hospital in Charlotte. That she said, I'll never forgive him. And Sam goes, but you're killing yourself. Well, I'd rather die than forgive him. So she said, and she did, of cancer. I mean, it was like, it was just eating away. And, you know, the Lord is saying here, I I'll heal a lot of things when everyone lays it at the feet of the Lord. Verse 9. Moving right along. Just a few verses left. Verse 9. I find it. I got, these, I got these new glasses on the way. Can't wait. They're progressives. I've never worn progressive. I don't even like the word progressive usually. But anyway, I'm going to wear them. And I, I, when my Bible, I can see the words great. The only thing I struggle with, I told my eye doctor just the other day, I'm sitting there in the exam, I said, she goes, well, you actually, I hate to, you do need a little bit of a reader. Not, not much, but I, she goes, are you struggling to read small print? I'm like, no, I read fine. I, it's the numbers. She goes, oh, because you only see the need to see a couple letters to know the whole word. But numbers, you actually have to see it specifically. So I will like, I'll be up here and you're, you're like, is he lost? His yes, there's nine right there. Then the Lord said to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. 
This day I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt. This radical obedience, and it was radical obedience. Everyone got the same command, same day, and Joshua, I'm sure, was just thankful that everyone decided to obey. I mean, you don't want to, you don't like arm wrestling people in obedience. You know, if you've had kids, you just like it when they obey. No, it's no fun to arm wrestle everyone into obedience. Please obey this. Please do it. It's like watching the police all over America's college campuses. You know, they, they have to arm wrestle people into obedience, literally. But this radical obedience and trust in God becomes the day, that, and Joshua wouldn't have foreseen this coming necessarily, this becomes the day, the day, that the reproach of Israel as slaves and wanderers that were mocked by the nations. Remember, for the 40 years that they walked in the wilderness, they were mocked by the nations. Hey, you guys, you guys got out of Egypt only to live in the desert? And year after year after year, the nations would mock them for living in the desert. Say, your God is so powerful, he got you out of Egypt to live in the desert. You own no houses. You own no vineyards. You own nothing but goats and sheep, and I don't even know how you feed them out there in the desert. So the nations mocked them. So they had 400 years of being mocked of being slaves, then 40 years of being mocked of being wanderers and vagabonds. And God's like, this is the day that I'm going to take away the reproach. All the mocking ends because you obeyed me. God can reverse any situation in your life on the day we start to obey. He says, now the reproach will end. And the nations are soon going to know it. They're going to soon know for sure that God has removed the reproach. Jericho will be first to know the reproach has been removed. Verse 10. Now the children of Israel camped in Gilgal. Obviously everyone is getting healed at this time. The children of Israel camped in Gilgal. God has put this protective bubble. No, no armies have come against them. And they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight in the plains of Jericho, exactly how it was prescribed to Moses 40 years earlier. And they ate of the produce of the land on the day after the Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day. Um, this consecration, uh, the men... They had, in the previous verse, the men had consecrated themselves. They presented themselves to be uh, to the Lord. And now they were, they were ready. And not only ready, they were required to take of the Passover. But they had to take of the Passover in the right frame of God's <laughs> commands. Prior to that day of circumcision, them taking the Passover would have been in violation of God's commands. Look up on the screen, uh, Exodus 12, 48. And when a stranger, this is, this is quoting, this is God himself speaking. By the way, every one of my quotes from the scripture are either God or Jesus speaking directly until I think the last verse I'll put up on the screen. But every single one of them are actually God speaking or Christ speaking. And when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover, Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. So God had already set it up that not only will you not go to Jericho until everyone's circumcised, you will not take of the Passover, but he makes sure that they're done and ready in time for the Passover. Everything is done exactly according to the clock of God that they had to be circumcised in time to take the Passover. Now, they had been either neglecting the Passover or taking it in an unholy manner for quite a few years now. But here, it was going to be correct. It was going to be right. Uh, it was not going to be taking the Lord's Supper with a bunch of sins that you don't, hey, I'm not repenting. I'm living with my girlfriend, I'm living with my boyfriend, I'm going to take communion anyway. People do that all the time. New Testament says some people sleep and even die because of this. But now they were ready, and now they were sanctified to remember and reflect on God's deliverance with genuine hearts of worship. And like I said, that's similar uh, to taking the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner that we would be confessing. You know, we, we can't remember every single thing, but we at least have a humble heart. The Lord, just wash me, cleanse me. And it's no coincidence 
that they now partake of the Passover here before advancing. And then, as I read in verse 11, they ate manna, it says, and they ate of the produce of the lamb um, on the day after the Passover. They had eaten manna all the way up until and through the actual Passover. Manna would still appear on the ground every morning, except for, remember, on the, uh, before the Sabbath, two amounts would appear, so they would actually have enough for that day and enough for the Sabbath. But manna appeared all the way up until this point. They were still, even on the other side of the Jordan and this side of the Jordan, they were still getting manna every morning on the ground. They were not going out looking for food. They would, wouldn't you like to try manna? Like the world's most perfect food that has ever been on earth. Had everything you want. I'm sure it was low in fiber. I mean, low in sugar, high in fiber. Uh, low in sugar, high in fiber, uh, high in nutrients, density rich uh, nutrients. You know, uh, you couldn't complain about it because it literally was heaven's food. Although they did, right? You know, and so you shouldn't complain about it because it was like the most perfect food. But, uh, but they had been receiving that for 40 years and, and they would receive it right up and through this Passover, right through this Passover. But the day after it, the day after this Passover, the man is gone. It never comes back. They began eating, the lamb, eating from the land the day after the Passover. God's timing was precise. God's timing was purposeful. The manna, as you know, symbolizes the incarnation of Jesus. How do we know? Well, Jesus says it himself. And then this one is Jesus speaking. Jesus himself says he is the bread that's come down from heaven. So he says himself, the manna was always a picture of him. Coming down out of heaven, it's a picture of the incarnation, which we remember around the Christmas season. And the produce of the land is a picture of the risen life in Christ, uh, where he takes us into the life of the Spirit. That's why we produce the fruit of the Spirit. The land is supposed to produce the fruit. We're supposed to produce the fruit. So it's a picture of, after this, after the manna is gone, it's a picture of the Spirit-filled life in the resurrection of Jesus. Um, which brings us to our final two verses in verses 13, uh, actually our final three verses, 13, 14, 15. Let's read them together. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite with him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No. But as commander of the armed Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. The Lord had said the same thing to Moses at the burning bush. He had to take his sandals off. It comes to pass, Joshua, they're, they're, they finish the Passover. He's near Jericho. He lifts up his eyes. He sees a man, and my, it's capitalized man, standing opposite him. He's got a sword drawn. You can't help but see the parallel of Jesus coming back at the end of the book of Revelation. Uh, of course, he'll have a sword proceed from his mouth. Uh, but he will be the commander of the army. We'll actually be following Jesus on white horses. If you're saved, you've got a white horse for your observer. You don't have to have any equestrian lessons. <laughs> you're just going to know. Your horse isn't going to like take a while to accept you. All that's taken care of. But you can see that here's a picture of the command of the Lord's army, which is going to be revealed to the whole world at the end of the age. The whole world will see Jesus as the commander, as the king of kings and lord of lords, and, and he's going to smite the nations with the sword of his mouth. Here he's got a sword drawn in his hand. It's in his hand. You can think of the sword of the word of God as well. Joshua says, I don't know who this is, are you for us or against us? I love Jesus' response. No. <laughs> Every commentary you read says, 
This is not the answer Joshua would have expected. In other words, God was saying, wrong question. The question of, are you with me? That was the question. Should, are, are we rightly aligned with you? But he didn't know at that moment. You gotta, you know, sometimes God humbles even the most useful servants, and Joshua certainly was. He says, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And he says, wrong question. I am not for any army. I'm above all the armies. All the armies. Earth will be his footstool, as the scriptures say in the book of Psalms. And Joshua recognizes at that moment, we know because the middle part of verse 14, Joshua falls on his face. At that moment, it instantly, the, the Spirit of God tells Joshua, this is nothing but the Lord himself. And he falls on his face in worship. Now we know he's not an angel because an angel, every time an angel is ever worshipped in the scripture, the angel says, no, you can't do that. That doesn't happen here. He receives the worship because this is none other than Jesus himself. A Christophany, a pre-incarnation appearance of Christ. Joshua falls on his face and, and then he asks a question that is responded to the way we might expect. He says, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander says, take off your feet. Take off, not your feet, take off your sandals. <laughs> can't take off your feet. You know, take off your sandals from your foot. The place you stand is holy. It's holy. Anywhere Christ is becomes holy. And so he says, take, you've asked a proper question. This is what I want you to do. Take off, just like I had Moses, your mentor, do. Now you're going to do the same thing. Take off your shoes and worship me there, which he does. William McDonald says, Christ has not come merely to help us, and certainly not to harm us. He comes to take full control. He comes to take full control. A lot of Christians want to give, we all do at times. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of this as anyone. We want to give God partial control. But he comes to take full control, which means you've got to take off your shoes, you've got to take off your will, you've got to take off your plans, you've got to take off your desires, you've got to take off whatever's hindering you from worshiping him. As we close, simple question, is Jesus in total command of your life? In total command of your life. Is your life being lived as worship unto him? And I'll close with this. We don't have to be spiritually recircumcised. We received that when we were born again. Amen? Once these Men were circumcised. They had to, never had to be recircumcised either. I was spiritually circumcised. We looked at this verse on Sunday because we were. In, remember, we had circumcision on Sunday too. The reverse. Remember, they were telling at the council, "No, these men do not have to be circumcised because they had already been circumcised at the heart level. They had been saved." And Paul writes of this in Colossians that you've received the circumcision of the heart. And I bolded those areas. Christ has done without hands. Now he did it with his nail pierced hands, but. He's done it in my life in 1995 with the Spirit of God invisibly working in my heart and anyone else who's been born again. So we don't have to be, we don't have to be spiritually recircumcised ever again. Once you're saved, you really are saved. However, we have to quite regularly, Romans 12 says daily, resurrender the consecration of our lives. That makes sense that we are constantly. Surrender ourselves as living sacrifices. Lord, I consecrate my life to you. Because little things get in the way, little specks, little hindrances. So we're continuing saying, Lord, I'm re-consecrating my life to you. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you again for this time this evening. We thank you, Lord, that the truths that you wrote uh, many centuries ago uh, in the days long before Jesus you came, were spiritual truths, were spiritual types, were spiritual foreshadows. And the book of Hebrews even speaks of this, Lord, that we can see. And, and they teach us, even today, how to walk in the promised land of the life and the Spirit. And Lord, we pray that uh, each and every one of us would be fully surrendered to you, not only our Lord and Savior, but the commander of our life. 
the commander of this church, the commander of the body of Christ. And Lord, we pray that uh, we would grow in trusting you and obeying you. For Lord, when we obey you, we are ready to advance. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord willing, see you uh, Sunday. And like I said, Mother's Day message, but it'll be for everybody. If you're able to come to the 2 by 2 outreach on Saturday, I know that uh, you'll be blessed. And that's at 11 a.m. Have a great, 11 a.m., right? Yeah. Have a great rest of the evening.